Good evening, everybody. We're going to let people gather for a minute or two. All right. Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. But uh, good evening. I'm Bob Fockler. I'm president of the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis. Um, thank you for joining, this, joining us this evening for our exploration and celebration of the arts sector in our community. As I'm sure you all know, a week or so, we, we passed a, a dubious milestone, the one-year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. The effects of the pandemic have touched literally all corners of our community. It's closed businesses and schools. It's can find us to our homes at times. It's put people out of work and to date, um, it's killed more than 1500 of our neighbors here in Shelby County. Um, but there are, there are positive notes to be sure. Mid Southerners have continued to be very, very generous. We raised more than $14 million from local and national sources for the Mid-South COVID-19 Regional Response Fund housed here at the Community Foundation. But most of that funding was, or soon will be, spent primarily on health and human services. And all that is as it should be. But what about the arts? Art groups were some of the first to feel the effects of the pandemic. The performing arts were particularly hit hard since so much of their work requires a live audience. The first venues to close and, and even today seeming the last ones so far to reopen have been theaters and concert venues and dance spaces. The impact on the revenues of these organizations was immediate and it's been lasting. But I suppose you could say, so what? Our arts groups, weren't feeding people or keeping families in their homes or administering uh, life-saving vaccines. I'm gonna guess if you're on this call though, you believe that there's more to the arts than just entertainment. The arts are how we express ourselves. They're how we communicate with each other. And in many ways, they're how we define ourselves. It's impossible to separate Memphis from our music heritage, from any of our other creative endeavors. The arts are truly, as the title of this evening states, the soul of our city. The arts groups in our city are led by very creative people and they've been busy over the last many months finding new ways to express their arts and to, com to communicate with their audiences. They've conjured up a variety of virtual and pop-up experiences that have sustained the soul of our city, even as it's struggled to deal with the oppressiveness of the pandemic. So what you'll hear tonight is about some of those struggles to be sure, but you'll mostly hear about resilience and what it will take to get us back to where we, where we were and how we can be fully open and vital and, and, and have that, the arts community that we have grown to love and cherish in Memphis and the Mid-South. And I promise sprinkled through it will be a few examples of what makes the arts so precious in our Mid-South community, talent, heart, and well, soul. So sit back, um, put questions in the chat box if you feel so inclined. And then please just listen, learn, and enjoy. To get us started, I'd like to send things over to Elizabeth Rouse. Elizabeth is president and CEO of Arts Memphis. Elizabeth, great to see you. Thank you so much, Bob, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I really wanna thank the Community Foundation for being the first to step up a year ago to help Arts Memphis and Music Export Memphis and others in our community support our people at a time when they were immediately without work. And we are grateful to the COVID, Mid-South COVID Regional Response Fund for initial investments in artists and arts organizations. I'd like to start now with a short video. Artists and arts organizations are driven to express emotions 
perspectives, and insights through visual art, unique experiences, and powerful performances. It is the mission of Arts Memphis to support them. But today, our artists are missing the traditional processes of creation and the palpable reactions of live audiences. The economic, social, and health landscape we all face today can seem daunting. However, it is precisely these unprecedented influences that are compelling our artists and arts organizations to rechannel their energy into new and inventive outlets. They are producing authentic, ingenious, and creative responses to the challenges of our time. The uncertainty of the future and fragility of the present require a timely response to our artists and arts organizations. Invest in the arts today for a powerful return in the future. Memphis is indeed strong and resourceful and resilient. And we at Arts Memphis have been hard at work to ensure that our arts community remains strong, but we're not finished. And we'll tell you about the work ahead later on in this presentation. Our goal tonight is for you to be reminded of the essential role the arts play in our individual lives and in our community. For you to experience a few of the artists and organizations who have rechanneled their energy in amazing ways this year. And finally, for you to engage in helping the arts sector recover and come back stronger than ever. So on the next slide, you'll see a bit about Arts Memphis and our 58 year history. Thanks to this community and our contributors, we have provided more than $85 million to arts organizations and artists in Shelby County since 1963. We support annually 70 organizations and now thanks to the launch of our artist emergency fund, we are also supporting hundreds of individual artists. Arts Memphis serves not only as a funder, but as a convener and connector for the arts sector. And our role in that area has been ever increasing this year. On the next slide, you'll see a list of organizations that Arts Memphis has supported in various ways this year. These organizations have varying budget sizes and genres and are located all over Shelby County. Pre-pandemic, these organizations provided more than 2.5 million arts experiences across every zip code in Shelby County. Half of those experiences engaged people of color, 500,000 of those experiences engaged youth, and 200,000 engaged people with disabilities. These organizations are using their art forms to enhance quality of life, to drive youth development outcomes, to offer healing, to offer connection, to bridge differences, to drive creativity and innovation, and to drive our economy. In fact, these organizations have budgets totaling more than $70 million, 20% of which is related to personnel employed by these organizations. On the next slide, you'll see a bit about the economic impact of the nonprofit arts and cultural sector pre-pandemic. The nonprofit arts in Shelby County are a $200 million industry driving more than 22 million in local and state government revenue. And on the next slide, you'll see some of the impacts that these organizations have faced this year. 44% of the nonprofit arts workforce has experienced layoff or furlough. Thankfully, many of the full-time positions were restored by the end of 2020, but most of the positions impacted were contract workers. There has been an 80% reduction in the number of artist engagements over the last year. Although as you'll hear later on, those are picking up, but that is why in recovery and resilience efforts, in addition to supporting organizations, Arts Memphis is focused on supporting individual artists across our community. And these organizations collectively have seen a 21% reduction in net income but they have been determined and they have been creative. And here are just a few photos of examples in addition to the ones you saw in the video. Organizations like Creative Aging have ensured that the seniors involved in their programs still had access. Their senior studio classes have provided more than 270 hours of virtual instruction 
not just painting and playing the dulcimer, but also helping seniors be comfortable with using computers. Many of us experienced great holiday performances, especially versions of the Nutcracker. Maybe you went to the Malco drive-in for New Ballet's Nut Remix. Organizations like Angel Street, a youth or organization focused on music for young girls, immediately made sure that their students had access last spring through their Angel Zone virtual programming. And organizations like Carpenter Art Garden based in Binghampton became hubs for mask distribution, for food distribution, and for art distribution. These organizations have been incredibly collaborative and incredibly creative. And tonight on the next slide, you will experience some of these organizations and artists. I wanna thank the Tennessee Arts Commission for sponsoring the performances and paying the participants tonight. We are fortunate in Tennessee to have a revenue model that is driven by the sale of specialty license plates to support the arts. So consider that next time you renew your license plate. And it is now my pleasure to introduce two critical partners of Arts Memphis who have been working with us over the last year to understand what the needs were in our arts sector and to think about opportunities to respond and help our community come back stronger. Amber Hamilton is the executive director of Memphis Music Initiative and will share about their work with youth and musicians and also more about the effects of the pandemic on the black arts ecosystem. And then Elizabeth Kaywan, who is founder and executive director of Music Export Memphis will share a little bit of her work about the music e ecosystem. So Amber, I will turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, and it's so great to be here with all of you virtually tonight. Uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, my name is Amber Hamilton. I'm the head of the Memphis Music Initiative. And I just wanted to share a little perspective with you tonight. Memphis is fundamentally a music city. My joke that I can only say in a room of Memphians, I'll deny it elsewhere, is that if this city stopped making music, we might as well be Jacksonville. And who wants that? I don't need to convince any of you that the soul of the city is with our artists. But as you look into the history of all the music forms that have come out of Memphis, whether that be blues or Southern rap or soul, you will find young black creatives. They have created genres of music that have changed the world. They have created soundtracks to social, mu social justice movements that have changed the world. What you need to know is that the same artistic genius that seems to be in our share of the Mississippi River mud, it still resides inside of our young people. MMI is just one of the organizations working to bring forth creativity inside of our young people. And in particular, black and brown youth whose typical music programming inside of schools or sometimes outside of schools have really been decimated by budget cuts pre-COVID. So you can imagine what programming is like to try to find now. The pandemic has been tough on our, all arts organizations to be sure, but organizations led by and serving black and brown youth have really taken things particularly hard. These organizations were already fighting to be heard and to be seen, but the crisis put many of our organizations on the precipice of closing, even as they managed to continue programming virtually to engage our youth. And just one example I wanted to share with you MMI recently hosted a virtual HBCU music audition. Our kids weren't able to go out and do the typical college visits they would be able to do. So we had to pivot and find a way for our young Memphis musicians to be heard and to be seen. I'm so pleased to report to you that 24 young people, all of them who are participated in our virtual audition were offered partial or full scholarships based on their music performances that day. Memphis music remains strong, but it needs to be invested in. Tonight, I'm excited to share with you just a small taste of the creative genius that Memphis has to offer, work that is continuing, continuing to be produced even during the pandemic. We'll feature the Collage Dance Collective led by the brilliant Kevin Thomas, and we will feature some young people from my very own program, MMI Works, led by Brittany Boyd Bullock and Iris Hollister, who will, you'll see on cello during the performance. 
So there's so much more to come. But with that, I thank you. And I pass the mic to my friend and colleague, Elizabeth K. Wine of, sorry, Music Export Memphis. Those are a lot of M's, Elizabeth, but I try to get it straight every time. Music it Export is. Memphis. Thanks. It is. It's okay. I didn't make it easy on you. Um, thank you so much, Amber. Uh, as she said, my name is Elizabeth K. Wine. I'm the founder and executive director of Music Export Memphis. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit export office for Memphis music. Um, we create opportunities for and subsidize working musicians, allowing them to tour, to build audiences outside the city, and to sustain their careers while leveraging them as ambassadors for Memphis to drive tourism, talent attraction, and for social, economic, and cultural benefit for all of us. Our work really stands in the gap between the music industry and philanthropy. Uh, and when our traditional programs went on hold in March of 2020, we immediately started fundraising for COVID relief efforts to support our musicians as they saw their livelihoods disappear overnight. In spite of how critical those musicians are, as Amber was, was saying, to the Memphis story, to the Memphis brand, most of these artists do not have a safety net. The wages paid per performance in most venues and clubs haven't changed in 20 or 30 years, as spending power in our economy have changed dramatically. There was no rainy day fund for a year of rainy days. So in partnership with Arts Memphis, we were able to distribute more than $309,000 in grants to musicians and music professionals. And we're proud to be one of very few funds nationwide to support live music professionals, not just performing artists through that work. Now in better times, uh, Music Export Memphis flagship program is called Experiences. We don't just produce a music showcase uh, around the country. We invite people to holistic, immersive Memphis experiences that fundamentally alter the way that they see our city. Um, it's tough to make all that happen by a Zoom, of course, but uh, we did want to be sure that you got a taste of the depth and breadth of our arts ecosystem. So Amber already mentioned a few of the groups that you're going to see perform tonight. And I will mention one more, uh, Taliba Safia, South Memphis born and raised singer songwriter and proud music export Memphis ambassador will be performing her song, 10 Toes Down. And with that, I am excited to introduce and hand the mic over to Nubia Yassin. Nubia is a poet, a filmmaker and a fine artist. She is the chief storyteller and videographer for The Collective and co-founder of New Jazz, a production house dedicated to amplifying the stories of Black women and queer folks of color. Nubia has written four original works for this evening that are being performed for the very first time. So without further ado, here's Nubia. Goodness, I was on mute. Well, hello, you all. Um, this first piece is called Toil. Have you noticed whenever they try to conjure us, do like they see, they try to mimic the certain bop, the limp of weight and the operative word here is try. It just don't develop right without the toil of poor and black. What a badge to wear and what a thing to want to steal, to want so desperately the stain of blood you never spill, fashioning a fashion of fracturing you never sustain. What a concept. The toil look none too pretty on my folk, except when it do. And I'm starting to resent our ability to make it all look so sexy. But no matter, for when we show only our underest belly, the grotesque they have made of us, the bulging eyes, the twisted mouth, they throw us pennies for the performance and thank us for our bravery. Hello out there. My name is Taliba Safia, and I'm so thankful to Music Export Memphis for having me today. I'm gonna be um, performing an original song today called Ten Toes Down, and I hope you enjoy. 
of the show. Peace. This next piece is called Shadow Work. I've been praying more and more and I think I know what we should do. Exhaustion is a real devil, but the time's here for practical action. We must move quickly, uncover what is innate, repurpose, refurbish, unlock inert potential in the dead things and the things thrown away. One must decolonize the body too, you know, spit out the poison a little more every day. It turns my guts, but it pleases my guides. And we've been talking, comparing notes, making plans and sharper point of anger. I have tools here mode and design, none of my proper stone, but when have we not made do? Not made food from dirt, not made song from exodus, dance from fight, but still so, so tired.
This next piece is called Burden. The children are always listening. While at play, listening. While sleeping, listening. Carrying, taking on that old burden of black. They learn so early that they are not small, not soft, uninnocent and undeserving. No tenderness to find, little no longer than it takes for the back of the ears to dry. We all but forget about them, leave them to listen and learn and grow burdened to perfect this performance of adulthood and try their best to make it there alive. <laughs> Thank you. 
This last piece is called Two Black Children. I wish you endless summer and secret crush to make you dizzy in play fight with your brother and sister. I wish you the swing highest from the ground so your shoes don't catch the mulch and slow you down. I wish you light up sneakers and mama and daddy who is tax return happy always. I wish you big sleepover, sleepover at grandma's house with all your cousins, the ones from up north too, and a breakfast of cheese grits in the morning. I wish you simple scrapes and running till your lungs burn. I wish you ease at night, safe travels and no worry. I wish you no burden. I love you the size of the ocean. I love you the number of stars. I wish you sweet dreams of space, of your place being everywhere and anywhere you plant your feet. I wish you peace. I pray you peace. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nubia, and I hope you will all join me either in the chat or a virtual applause for Nubia and all of the performances tonight. Uh, really incredible. Nubia has worked with the collective uh, for many, many years. She is their chief storytelling officer, and the collective is an organization that has been um, providing a platform for Black artists. And they say that they believe that by empowering both artists and the communities they serve, we will begin to shift the culture of Memphis towards positive growth and strength. And that is what this effort is about, positive growth and strength. So our plan for the next 12 to 18 months as we think about what it will take to help our art sector recover and come back stronger um, is really that in addition to Arts Memphis's typical grant making and support efforts, we will be focusing on accelerating recovery and supporting a resilient ecosystem through transformational investment, equitable investment and capacity building. As Pat Mitchell Worley, who is the executive director of the Stax Music Academy says, this is not just about the now, it is about our collective future. And this is an opportunity not just to help arts groups and artists recover what, from what has been an incredibly difficult year, but most importantly, to come back stronger. It is indeed about Memphis's collective future. On the next slide, you will see um, that the soul of our city, recovery and resilience in the arts sector. This effort is focused on two areas. First, immediate and targeted infusion of funds for COVID relief. And second, focused on investments in people and processes and programming that will make our arts community stronger and more accessible. As we think about recovery and resilience, we are focused on these essentials you see on the slide now essentials that we believe will drive a thriving arts community. Stabilizing organizations, putting artists to work both within organizations but as individual artists of all types in our city, supporting leaders of color, supporting strong programming paired with effective marketing strategies, supporting collaborations and systems for efficient operations, and creating a safety net of reserve funds. In fact, pre-pandemic, about 50% of Arts Memphis grantees had any form of reserve or endowment. And of those organizations, 11% had leaders of color. We know we must invest in helping strengthen the arts sector uh, by providing financial resources, helping groups establish long-term priorities such as reserves, and certainly supporting our leaders of color and our organizations who are serving pe primarily people of color in our community. So as we wrap up tonight, um, we want to share a short video of a piece that was done by Memphis muralist uh, Kong Wei Peng, and I'm gonna share her piece as I make some closing remarks. So as you think about how you might help support resiliency and recovery. I hope you will 
consider giving through your donor advised fund at the Community Foundation or through Arts Memphis directly at artsmemphis.org slash donate. I hope you will stay in touch with this effort and with organizations and artists in our community to learn how you might become involved on community panels and in other volunteer roles. And in addition of your support of this collective effort, we ask you to engage in supporting artists and arts groups right now. There are many, many exciting opportunities, especially as the weather gets better and vaccinations move more quickly. Experience a virtual event like those that Playhouse on the Square continues to offer. Experience a museum like Rock and Soul Museum. Attend an in-person event in a Hattie Lou pod or enjoy Ballet Memphis at the Levitt Shell or enroll your children in summer camps, a critical opportunity for organizations to drive earned income. Think about how you might engage in participating in some of these activities and think about how you might engage in supporting this community-wide effort to drive recovery and resilience in our art sector, a sector that is critical to Memphis. Memphis cannot recover if our art sector doesn't recover. I'd like to um, open it, turn it over to Elizabeth K. One, who is gonna help moderate a Q&A for us. Um, and Elizabeth has been driving this behind the scenes. So thank you for all of your help on producing this tonight, Elizabeth. If you have questions, we had some questions that were submitted early, which we will cover, but we also invite you to uh, list questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A function. So definitely drop questions that you have there, but we've got a few that came in early. So we'll start with those. Um, what do you see, so we'll start big. What do you see as the biggest hurdle to recovery? I'll jump in there. Um, one is how we address immediate needs while really, and how organizations address their immediate needs while focusing on some of these more futuristic and, and infrastructure um, opportunities we have to improve. But we really believe that one of the key pieces of recovery is going to be helping organizations and, and artists have the funding to provide quality programming while also marketing those programs. It's gonna to continue to be a very competitive environment. And so strong programming and marketing are really key. I'll jump in and add quickly to that, that um, as Elizabeth outlined some opportunities for people to directly start to support um, artists uh, and arts organizations, I would definitely encourage you to think about the big scope of those things and think about how you can directly support arts, things that they are selling, EPs that they are putting out, merchandise, but also our small and medium sized organizations, especially those led by people of color. I can't express how uh, precarious their position has become during this crisis. So as they are hosting virtual events, as they are doing so everything from Memphis Black Arts Alliance to Memphis Jazz Workshop to so many others, uh, please think about supporting these small events because your, your you know, small ways of participating mean a lot to those organizations in time like this. So as much as it's the big things, it's also the little things. Yeah, I'll, I second that, Amber, and uh, just will say that, you know, we can't um, take it for granted and we need to sort of have a long memory for this moment um, and make those investments. Um, Amber, this is a question that um, might you might be uniquely suited to take. Um, what connections are there or have been made uh, with the educational community and school age children who have lost so much during this time? Uh, it's been a tremendous effort to pivot, both by uh, the teachers um, and by partners like Memphis Music Initiative um, in classrooms and to engage young people virtually. Um, this time period of technology, it's been, as I'm sure you all have seen in your lives, a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways. It allows us um, as a partner to bring in influences, to bring in guest speakers, to bring in people that we probably wouldn't have connected in the same way through the classroom. So for example, um, we were connected to another arts organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, that has their, home, their own hip hop collective. 
So through this period, we were kind of inspired to say, what would happen if we brought our students together and just put them in the room and let them create, let them hear each other's music. I don't know if we would have done that a year ago because that's not what we were thinking about. So it's opened up opportunities, but at the same time, it's very difficult, especially for elementary age children to you know, remain attentive and to get everything that they need. So we have had to become extremely innovative. Music teachers have had to become ex extremely innovative. Um, you know, it's hard to ask their kids to practice their saxophone when they are learning, you know, five feet from their brother who is not in music class at that moment. So, you know, we've had to really um, just continue to bring in new ways, new curricula, new platforms, and new engagement activities. And let me just shout out not only to our music fellows, but to all of the music teachers um, ac across Memphis who have been doing an amazing job of just trying to continue to keep things innovative. All right, this Elizabeth, this one might be suited for you to take. Will funding from the American Recovery Act be used to assist arts workers with technological capacity and career building needs? Sure. So what I know about the American Recovery Act as it relates specifically to arts funding through the National Endowment for the Arts right now is that the National Endowment for the Arts received $135 million that they are working through how that's going to be distributed. We know that 60% of that will be distributed through National Endowment for the Arts programs and 40% will go to states to distribute. So for that would be through the Tennessee Arts Commission, most likely in Tennessee. Um, I'm not sure that specifics have been announced as far as what those funds can be used for, uh, but I would imagine that there would that there would be some capacity building programming connected with some of those dollars. Um, so more to come on that as, as those plans develop. And then on the, I'm sorry, I'll, I will also add to that on the technical side, um, sort of the same answer, but many of many local organizations have had the opportunity to request other relief funding for specific technical needs related to the pandemic. And so that may continue because virtual events and access are here to stay. Um, so I would imagine that would continue. Here's another one uh, we received prior to the event. How can we create better pathways for revenue creation for our artists outside of performance-based events? Um, I can jump in and take that one. Um, you know, Music Export Memphis certainly it has been very focused in the last year on something that really needs to happen sector wide, which is changing our approach to opportunity creation, um, being and being a bit more diversified. You know, we if we are uh, if our artists only have revenue streams that are based on the live and experiential economy, um, certainly anything that you know prohibits public performance from happening is going to to um, you know cut them off from their livelihood completely. Um, so we're uh, particularly looking at ways to build programming that is not uh, solely based on live performance that still speaks to our mission um, and really approaching it as a subsidy for working artists as opposed to um, a, a one-off program and looking at it sort of from a bigger picture. But I think that it will be critical for us as a sector to be more diversified in the ways that we um, it, you know, and the, the, the onus is on us a bit as organizations, I believe, that employ artists to uh, not just on the artists themselves to sort of think through some of these problems. And here we'll go to the questions in the chat. Um, while I appreciate Memphis' focus on music, how are other visual, literary, and film arts and artists being supported in the city? I'm happy to start and then if either of you wants to jump in. So at Arts Memphis, we support all art forms. And so um, we had this artist emergency fund launched last year and it turned out that about 70% of the applicants, so about 70% of, of the 640 recipients were musicians. And we have to acknowledge that um, Memphis is in so many ways a music town. However, um, the remainder of that funding did go to artists of all types and then as far as Arts Memphis's support of organizations, uh, we continue to support all art forms um, regardless and all organizations, regardless of how long they've been around or what their budget size is. 
Yeah, I think it's an important aspect of all of this. Um, I know from a Memphis Music Initiative perspective, we support and fund organizations that do step outside of them, of, of music. Um, that's obviously our core, but um, organizations like Casa Teatro are doing wonderful work. Um, music, theater, storytelling, so much happening there. Um, other organizations are also really diversifying in this time because what we find is that with young people, they are artistic agnostic. You know, they, they just want to create something. They want to make something. They are makers. They don't want to be put in a box about it has to be music or it has to look like this. They want to create the soundtrack. Then they want to create the, the visual to it. Then they want to create a whole, you know, written form to it. Then they want to have an anime series based on it. So for us, it's been important to support all art firms and the connection between those. There are a lot of really great partners in the city that are expanding and diversifying so that they can do that proficiently. This question kind of goes back um, maybe to, you know, the, the hurdles to recovery topic, but what do you see as the greatest challenges for the greatest recruitment and funding challenges uh, for this effort? Uh, I'll jump in for a moment, just kind of, um, kind of pursuant to some of the things we've said. Um, I totally understand that there has been a community focus on kind of bottom of the pyramid needs, you know, food, shelter, all of those things. But the thing that makes us a community, the thing that binds us, the main things that makes us special, the things that makes us not generica um, is music and the arts is really with the tie that binds in this community. So I think it's kind of, it feels um, a little tertiary sometimes to some people to say, hey, think about, you know, taking your very generous dollars and supporting the arts during this time. Um, but it's so fundamental to who we are. And if I could speak for young people for a moment, it has been an extremely important social emotional outlet during this time for them to have the means to create, especially during school time. Um, if any of you have children who are at home doing uh, home learning, or even hybrid learning, you all know that they need a creative break um, because they're driving you nuts. So <laughs> they need, you know, times where someone says, okay, we're gonna write a song. We're gonna, you know, compose something. We're gonna produce something. We're gonna arrange something where they can just be free. Um, and that's so necessary to their mental health um, and so necessary to community mental health. So I think it's it's reframing and, and reshifting of kind of what we need to invest in when times are tough. Um, it absolutely is food, clothing, and shelter, but it's also the things that keep us alive, the things that keep us uh, focused on meaningful, the meaningful parts of life. Yes, here, here. I will build on that from a per perspective of the sort of commercial music, uh, music ecosystem. Um, I think that it has been very easy to communicate, um, you know, sort of it, particularly the earliest days of COVID, why relief funds were needed for working musicians, for a musician who works on Beale Street. Um, for example, all of those, those gigs were gone. It was, it was just really clear to anyone that was giving to us um, what they, why the need was so great and what they were supporting. Um, I think that the challenge that I see ahead is that, the need to philanthropically support our professional musicians will still exist um, beyond this pandemic. And uh, it's going to, to, to Amber's uh, point of reframing and shifting, it's going to require us to change the way that we think about um, you know, what, who, is, who is deserving of sort of philanthropic support um, and recognizing that in spite of the fact that our artists are entrepreneurs and small businesses, uh, that they they do require subsidy in order to thrive in our community and to connect back to Amber's point, um, when they thrive, our community as a whole thrives. And that is incredibly critical. But I think bridging that gap and sort of continuing to communicate the need past this most heightened moment in the pandemic is going to be really challenging. Yeah, and I think for arts organizations, it's, you know, really having to help people understand the role they play that is so much more than offering an art experience inside a theater. I mean, it is the mental wellness supports that New Ballet Ensemble provides their students. It is the same opportunities that Stax Music Academy provides their students every day, or the 
opportunities that a creative aging provides for seniors who are homebound. And so really thinking differently about um, the role that arts organizations play in our community will be key. And I'm muted. We've got a couple more questions here in the chat. Um, would you describe more about how Arts Memphis and the Community Foundation will support arts leaders of color in Memphis, especially for individual arts workers who are not connected to an organization? Sure. So uh, prior to the pandemic, Arts Memphis had one grant program for individual artists, and that was our primary support for individuals. Through that effort, we were providing different opportunities so that those individuals could become aware of the opportunity to apply for funding and then get help through funding, through the application process. We um, set some very specific inclusion goals with that program and then, and, and had some great success. And then March, 2020 hit and all of a sudden we jumped from funding 10 artists a year to hundreds of artists a year. And so the good thing is that we have a huge database now of artists of all types who are working in our community and that we didn't have before. And so I think we will rely on them to help us really craft what this long, so, long term support of artists looks like. Um, and so that's, you know, we want to involve the people who will benefit from this in our process of creating some of these programs. Um, so I think initially we will be focused on what is needed in a, a second phase, if you will, of emergency support, what's needed right now. And then how do we create long-term supports for individuals and also a long-term artist emergency fund for our community so that when individuals need it, there is access um, because in Memphis, we did not have that until a year ago. And I'll chime in for the Community Foundation. The, the Community Foundation is the largest grant maker in, in actually in the in the state of Tennessee. Um, we make annual grants of about $150 million a year. Um, the, the way we're set up, most of those grants are in the control of our donors, the thousand or so individuals, families, and organizations that have charitable funds with us. Uh, and they're the ones that make most of those decisions. So my, my first answer is one of the ways we can make sure we're supporting um, arts leadership of color uh, is by times like this, lifting these issues up and, and showing to our donors who have chosen to join us tonight um, what really is important. So that, that's that's one thing. Um, in terms of the, the community, the foundation's own discretionary grant making, virtually all of that now is, is, is in the COVID realm. Um, and we have, as I said in my intro, uh, an awful lot of that is going to health and human services, but we have um, had some very important set aside programs, um, including a, a specific support for um, marketing and development, specifically for organizations led by individuals of color. So, uh, and, and we have also in, in our other um, COVID related grant making um, given priority to organizations led by uh, um, individuals of color. For instance, in the most recent grant round where we were making funding grants to smaller organizations, organizations with uh, budgets under a million dollars um, we did have priority for that, and I think 52 or 53 percent of the grants did go to organizations led by individuals of color. Um, in terms of, of supporting individual arts workers, it's a little bit challenging for us because we're constrained by tax law. Tax law does not allow us or our donors to make grants to, directly to individuals, but that's why we helped Arts Memphis set up uh, the, the, the program that does support individuals, and that's why we, we funded it uh, as heavily as we did. So. That's 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 my answer. The, the, the answer is, to, is to, to show these problems with as bright a light as you possibly can and bring all, everybody that cares around them. I would encourage everyone, donors, board members, influencers um, surrounding all of these organizations to continue to keep the conversation going and make sure that you are asking your leaders to be accountable on issues of racial equity. Um, the more we continue to bring this up, it doesn't have to be always brought up by Black people. It can be brought up by anybody. It should be brought up by everybody. But uh, I would encourage everybody to ask questions. Um, and if they're not getting satisfactory answers, to push further to make sure that this issue does not become you know, a flavor of the moment, but because becomes a sustained commitment to racial equity and justice in our community. We need people to continue to ask those questions. And I thank you for raising it. Amber is good at that. Uh, we've got a question about 
corporate giving, um, whether or not the corporate community in Memphis has increased their contributions to the arts and artists, um, and uh, potentially how Arts Memphis or the Community Foundation might help or encourage corporate partners to give more to the arts. Yeah, so the data we've collected from about 50 arts groups over the last year, looking at their revenue sources and what corporate support of the arts looks like you know, overall for nonprofit arts-based organizations, we did see a pretty significant decrease in corporate support last year. Uh, a lot of corporations turned to what they saw as very, very immediate needs. And in fact, of, of the larger SAS arts organizations, they even saw and, and groups who have a lot of sponsored events, they saw almost a 56% decrease in corporate support last year. So we are focused on how we can get that back up and being creative about how we uh, in, encourage corporations to support the arts outside of event sponsorships and, and continue to provide unrestricted support. So we have some work to do, but I really feel like doing it together is key. And so we're looking at how as a sector we can go in with some collaborative asks and, and that sort of thing. That being said, we do have some really fantastic and loyal corporate supporters of the arts sector, which Memphis should be, is fortunate to have. And from the community foundation standpoint, we, we, um, we, we can't make anybody do anything, but we, we do the same thing. We, we bring um, funders together, um, the Mid-South Philanthropy Network brings uh, funders together. We try to get everybody around the table, including um, the corporate philanthropy, um, but it's tough. Uh, they're, they're generally looking for one thing, which is basically advancing their brands. And um, when there's not performances, it makes it hard for them to do that. Uh, one thing we should, we should point out, if, what people don't always realize is they, they tend to think that corporate philanthropy is gigantic in Memphis, and it's really not. Uh, we did a study of, of philanthropy across the city a couple of years ago, and, and corporate philanthropy is only about 10% of giving in this community. So um, that, that's why the Community Foundation really focuses on individual giving, and that's why um, we, we have things like this. We don't have any more questions in the coming in through the Q and A. So um, I will just take the second to let everyone know that you'll receive an email um, with the recording of tonight's session, um, including those wonderful performances. Uh, you'll receive that tomorrow and links to other ways that you can help support all arts programs in Memphis. And um, I will, hand it over to Elizabeth for any any last comments or and to Bob as well. No, just thank you all so much for tuning in and know that our Arts Memphis staff and, and all the partners on this call and I, I know also the Community Foundation staff, we are available if you have questions about how to engage and contributing to resilience and recovery in the arts sector, but also if you just want to talk about some of the things we've discussed tonight or be connected with any of these wonderful uh, performers you've seen. So thank you for tuning in. Okay, thanks, everybody. I thank, thank the leaders for putting this together. And uh, thank our donors for for uh, for tuning in tonight. Thanks, everybody.